trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your son. What a gift. Jesus, we thank you for bringing us life, for giving us eternity with you, for giving us new life, a new heart, for taking our heart of stone and, and uh, giving us a heart of flesh. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who is here today making clear to us your living words that, God, you will transform hearts and minds as we hear what your spirit is saying to the church today. And, and I thank you, Lord, for this joyful letter of, of Philippians that we have the privilege of opening up today and, uh, and, and hearing these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just thank all my plaid brothers today. They got the memo, I guess. That was not coordinated. Not at all. The children uh, can head out for kids' church which is just through the doors up at the front here. And we are opening our Bibles to Philippians. This is a new series in the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And we're going to be spending uh, about the next 19 weeks here, and including Christmas and other holidays in between uh, that probably will take us right up till spring of 2024. But uh, this is an amazing little letter, and as I was reviewing this letter, just certain things were standing out to me, and, and random thoughts jump into my head, uh, you know, when Paul says that, you know, we're the true circumcision, all of a sudden it jumps into my head that little fact of it was the eighth day that they said that the child was to be circumcised in the Old Testament. This is what God has instructed in his word. So what's significant about the eighth day? Well, it had other significances as well, but one thing that stands out to me is that in modern medicine, we learn that a baby at eight days, uh, and, I, and I checked all this information medically wise to make sure it wasn't just one of those things pastors pull out and say, hey, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is something really significant, and it turns out that they're just, you know, repeating somebody else who repeated somebody else. So I looked it all up, and it's, it's actually medical truth that at, at eight days, the baby's level of immunity is at a peak. Um, it, the other thing is that eight days, the, the blood is able to coagulate more easily. There's a, a certain level of vitamin K in the blood. A, another thing is that at eight days, the baby is fully recovered from its last traumatic experience, which is helpful for this new one. And uh, everything is situated perfectly for that eighth day experience. And this is something that was written 
thousands of years before microbiology was discovered uh, and germ theory and all this kind of stuff and all this stuff in the Bible, you know, like washing hands under running water. Don't you wish they would have done that earlier? The Bible actually says to do that for the priests when they were to do procedures and uh, looking at the people with different things such as leprosy and skin diseases. They were to wash their hands under running water. And there's so many things in the Bible that are the truth of God that if we, if they would have known back in those days, they would understand, you know, hey, there's, there's stuff behind all of this, but they just did it because they were being obedient to God's word. Well, there's still things in God's word today that we find out every Sunday as we're going through the word, things that we learn that we might look at and say, you know, I don't, I don't understand why God wrote that. I don't understand why he instructed that. And it doesn't make sense to my human mind. And I want to challenge you today saying, you know, maybe we're, maybe within this lifetime, we'll find out some of the reasons behind some of those things. But I want to encourage you, just trust God. Trust him that his word is truth and trust him that what he asks of us is necessary in order for us to honor him and live a life that's pleasing to him. And so with that, we're going to begin this letter to the, uh, and please forgive me if I mistakenly say Philip, uh, Philippines throughout the sermon series instead of uh, Philippians, because our, our church loves the Philippines and we do missions in the Philippines. And so that's inevitable that's going to happen quite often. But Paul's letter to the Philippians feels like such an old friend to me. This letter is a letter that is precious to me. When I first started ministry, my first letter to memorize was James's letter to the church of the tri 12 tribes scattered abroad. So I memorized that, and that was so impactful to me as an 18-year-old youth pastor at the time. By the time I was senior pastor at 21 uh, here at Sweets, 28 years ago, uh, Philippians stood out to me, and I thought, that's my next endeavor. I want that in my, I want this, as throughout my ministry, I want to know that Philippians is something that's close to me, because it's a book of joy. It's a book that'll help me in diff difficult times, and so this is the book I submitted into my memory and my heart as I drove back and forth uh, every day to school, an hour and a half there, an hour and a half back, and uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I had some close calls as I'm memorizing. I learned not to hold my sheet up so high and, and uh, maybe commit it to my memory before I headed out so I didn't cause any accidents on the road. I'm a little more careful with my memorizing, but I'm thankful, so thankful that this is, this is in my heart because, you know, when I get caught up thinking about things that are happening in the world, I get caught up thinking about uh, the government and, and some of their woke, weird ideologies that are just kind of like, I feel like they're ruining Canada, right? You feel these things sometimes and I get worked up and I get all angry. I watch the news and, and then all of a sudden I remember Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm a citizen of Canada, but guess what? I'm a citizen of heaven. Ultimately, that, is, that supersedes, and that just gives me peace. You know, when I find that my thoughts are dragging me down into the gutter in the sense of my mind is focusing on bitterness or focusing on envy or I have a lustful thought or things that my mind, places my mind shouldn't go, I'm reminded, reminded of Philippians 4 verse 8, which says that, Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely. And he goes on to tell us that we are to meditate, to think on these things, to dwell on these things and get our minds off the things that are um, going to drag us down low. Whenever I feel like there's a situation that is outside of my control, which is weekly, <laughs> outside of my ability, I think I can't handle this. I just can't do this. Whenever those things happen, I remember Philippians 4.18, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I mean, contextually, he was talking about the uh, dealing with having either a lot of money or no money at all. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but we can apply that to many areas of our life. And so when we look at this letter, this letter is so rich, and I want the scripture to be there for all of us. I encourage you to memorize key passages in this letter to the Philippians because it is precious. But today I want to give you a brief over, overview and I want to focus on three different areas. I want to focus on the man, on the church, and on the prison. Those are the three areas. If you're taking notes, just jot those down as we go through. But first of all, the man. What about this person that made this book such a lovely, impactful, great book or, or great letter? It was the Apostle Paul. You see, Paul was this guy who was so 
full of this confidence and joy in God's ability to work through every single circumstance. He just trusted. He knew God's got this. God's going to do something great. And he constantly lived that way. And therefore, as you read through this letter to the Philippians, 16 times, he says joy or rejoice to the Philippians. It's a book, a letter full of the joy of the Lord. Now, Paul wrote this letter 30 years after he had an encounter with the one who would change him forever. You see, Paul wasn't always this joyful guy. He was this man who was very, very legal and very focused on fighting for what he thought was the truth. And he thought that the Christian group was a cult. He thought these Jesus followers were crazy and that he was to protect the pure uh, Torah from these Christians who were taking away from the Torah by their crazy beliefs in this person called Jesus. And so Paul, in his younger days, they called him Saul. He would go around and he would try stomping out the church. And he would see a little light over here and he'd try stomping it out. And, and as the moment he got that fire put out, there's another one over here. He might as well have tried to put out the sun itself. He could not stomp out the church. The church was shining brightly for Jesus Christ. And we have these stories, one in particular, where we hear about this, this guy, Paul, who was called Saul. We hear about him standing there. And remember the first Christian martyr? His name was Stephen. And he was preaching boldly the gospel. And because of his declaration that Jesus is the son of God, they wanted to kill him. And so they were given the go-ahead and they were stoning him with stones. What does that mean? It means they were picking up rocks, throwing at them at him until they knocked him senseless and, and, and all the life would be exited from his body. What a terrible, terrible way to die. And you look at this and you think, how could people do this? And yet guess who's standing there holding the coats and kind of taking care of the possessions of all the young men who had really good arms and could throw rocks really hard. We have Paul standing there, holding their coats, saying this is, this is an act of God on the life of this man who's preaching these heresies. And so he's carrying on this act of terror, terrorizing the churches, but then he finds himself on the road to Damascus. And he's going to, he's going to deal with these Christians some permission to take out some more house churches. He's going to get permission. He's excited about doing the work of God. And suddenly he, he meets with the light bringer himself. He meets with Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Jesus literally blinds him on the road. Physically and spiritually, he removes the blinders. And he allows Paul to see his sinfulness. He says to Paul, why are you kicking against me? Why are you fighting me? Why are you persecuting my church? And so Paul has to answer to this. And in the process, he finds out that Jesus truly is the son of God, that he is the long-awaited Messiah. And he gives his life to Jesus Christ. He repents and he is told by, by um, God that he was going to suffer great things. And he sure did. So here we have the man who wrote the letter. He is a man who did terrible things. And yet he said in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he says, it was like I was born out of due time. It's like I'm, I was an apostle born out of due time. I didn't get to meet Jesus with the rest of you the way you did, but I met him on the road. And I tell you, he changed my life. And his life from that point forward was defined by joy. And it grew ever more as he lived his life. He grew and grew in joy. And so we see that, uh, you know, like Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord, it's his strength. Paul was a man full of strength, endurance, because of God's joy all over him. And this isn't in a manufactured joy that you try to work up to get your, you know, you know that's possible. You can do that. You, you can do that through effort. You can, if you just do the simple act of smiling, you know, some of you came and you're not feeling like smiling. And if I just said, okay, everybody just smile for a bit. And you do the physical act of smiling. You put a smile on your face. It does change something inside of you. But there's no reason to smile. And beyond that, some of the things he went through are so terrible. How could he possibly get through them? It was an inner joy. It wasn't a forced outward action that he, you know, just tell your face to smile. It was an inner joy that caused, it, caused his whole life to be changed. It's like the psalmist says, joyful, happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in God's word. And in his word, he meditates day and night. He's going to be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. And so 
He's full of the joy of God, this man named Paul, because of Jesus. The second thing we see is the church. The church at Philippi is the church that we're talking about here in this letter. And we know that Paul loved all the churches. We see that throughout his letters. But not only that, Paul loved the Jewish people. He said, he says, I wish I, I myself could be accursed so that I, if, you know, for the, for the, my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, that they could come in. I, I myself would, would, uh, would give up all my rights in order for them to know Jesus. You know, his heart broke for them. He, he wept, he cried for them. He even wept and cried for, for those that were opposed to the gospel. He, he had a huge heart for the Gentiles. But I tell you, Paul ultimately had a heart for the church. He loved the church. And we see this. We see this in Romans 1.8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Everybody's talking about your faith, you Romans. And he told them, I, I love you guys. I thank God for you. He said to the Ephesians in 1.15, therefore I also... After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you. I make mention of you in my prayers. That was his address to the Ephesians. But Philippi, this church, the church that we're talking about in this letter, they had a special place in Paul's heart. Paul had a deep relationship with them. This is how he addresses them in 1.3. He says, I thank my God, upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. He just, every time he thought of these guys, a smile would put, go on his face. He couldn't help it. He had deep inner joy because of what God was doing. He says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul's saying, over the last 10 years that I've known you guys, I just, I just smile. Every time I think of you, I'm, I'm joyful, and I joyfully request that God does something in your life. And he says in 4.1, therefore, my beloved brethren, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved, 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 long for beloved. He, you can just see how much Paul loves this church. So what is it? You know, did you know Paul and Silas, they didn't even intend to go to Philippi in the first place? They had no intention to go to this area. And start a church there. That wasn't their plan. In fact, they wanted to go to Asia. And what happened is God kept on putting roadblocks in front of them. The Holy Spirit kept on saying, no, you're not going that way. Cancel that ship. You know, you're going to cancel that. And you block you here. And roadblocks. Every time they try to go this way, God was saying, no, you can't go that way. And then what happened is at, at Troas, Paul gets this vision where a man from Macedonia is calling him and saying, come come over to Macedonia. And so he travels across to that area. You see, Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We could equally say that the roadblocks in front of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You know, that God will use roadblocks. And some of you have experienced those roadblocks. You're going along, you have your plan. You think this is what God wants you to do. This is what you want to do. And you're pretty sure God wants you. And it's not a bad thing. And yet, all of a sudden, a huge roadblock in your way. And you're like, oh, God, all your plans are ruined. It's like, well, not really. Those were your plans. Great, good plans and all, you know, good, good job on the, on the thinking and your little list. But I have other plans for you. And therefore, you know, he just puts a roadblock in front of you. Or like Andrew in the Bible, he just teleports you to a new location. I haven't seen that one yet, but that would be amazing. And so God, he orders your steps because he has plans for you. And so they end up in Philippi, which is a leading city in Macedonia. And they meet this lady named Lydia, who's dying. She, she, she works in the dye trade. But she, on this day, she's worshiping near the river. And it's likely that there wasn't even enough Jews in the city to form a synagogue. You needed 10 men to form a synagogue. So worshipers would often meet at bodies of water. And so they're meeting to worship. And Paul comes along and shows them that Jesus is the Messiah. And I love this because Lydia likely was a Gentile who was called a proselyte, somebody uh, who is coming into Judaism and believes that the God of the Jews is the true God. And now she gets introduced to Jesus and she's like, Paul, you got to come over to my house. You know, and, and so they celebrate and they start this new, um, this, this, this new walk with different people who are worshiping there and they're eating together and, and uh, worshiping, evangelizing. And, and one day this de demonic girl's following them around and she's, you know, she's announcing, she's saying, these guys are, you know, listen to them. They're men of the, the, the holy God. And like, she's saying good stuff, but she's just really obnoxious and annoying. And she's driving everybody nuts because she's actually demon possessed. So she's speaking the truth, but doing it in a way in which, you know, everybody knows that this, this woman is, 
or this young girl is, is demon possessed. And so Paul casts the demon out of her, but does not realize what he just unleashed. You see, they were making money. On, this, is, this is the sad reality, is that a lot of times the people that are in power, the people who are making money, they don't want people to be free. They don't want you to be free of your addictions and your patterns because they profit off of those things, you see? And so they profited off of this young girl because she would give divination. She would, you know, tell uh, what a dead person's saying or tell something about the future. She, would, she was doing these things on behalf of demons and people were making money off of this trade using this girl. And so when she was set free, goodbye money, hallelujah. They didn't, you know, they didn't know what to do, so they attacked Paul and, and they threw him into prison and falsely accused him. And so Paul's thrown into prison and, and Paul gets beaten. And, uh, you know, on and on, we hear these stories about how God is working in different people. He works through the prison guard and the whole prison guard and his family get saved. And, and so many people end up uh, following God in this city. And now 10 years have passed and this church is vibrant. They're excited about serving God. They, they remember Paul fondly. Paul, you know, 10 years have passed since he initially planted this church. You know, we don't know how often he had been back to visit, but we know this. They love Paul and Paul loves them. And then they hear that Paul's in prison in Rome. And so they say to their brother, Epaphroditus, who's in their church, they say, can you bring a gift to Paul? He needs our help. He, when you're in this prison in Rome, you need money to, to survive. You have to pay your own way in this, this type of prison. And, and also, they wanted to help out with the work that Paul was doing and, and provide him with whatever he needed. And so they sent Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus, he didn't just you know, make a day trip over to Paul. He had to go to the coast. He had to get on a ship cross the Adriatic Sea, and then he had to go way inland to Rome to, to, to offer what was being provided to Paul. 900 kilometers he had to travel. He had to travel for a month in order to bring these goods to Paul. And in his time there, he gets very sick, and we'll learn that as we go through this letter to the Philippians. And so we see this love. We see this joyful man and his love for this church and this church's love for Paul. And uh, then we see the third thing we need to realize is that we see the prison. You see, Philippians is known as many of the letters of Paul as the prison letters. It's a prison letter. It was written because he was in a Roman prison. You see, he always wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome to see the Christians in Rome. He says that he, he was praying that he would find a way in the will of God to come to you, he says. Roman Christians, he says, I'm praying. I'm trying to find a way in the will of God. I'm looking for some avenue where I can get to you guys and visit you guys. This is what Paul wants to do. But little did he know that God was going to use this way. And this is the way that God chose. While Paul was in another prison, he, he was speaking to the, uh, the leaders and they, they were kind of debating with him and, and talking to him. And, and I think they, it, it gives the impression they were ready to like set him free and just kind of move on with this thing. But Paul goes, I appeal to Caesar. Well, as a Roman citizen, he had the right then to go all the way to Rome and appeal to, to be heard by Caesar in Rome. And so they're like, you know, I think it was Festus, but he's like, you appeal to Caesar, so be it. You'll, you'll see Caesar. And so he ships him off to Rome. And on the way to Rome, he actually gets shipwrecked and ends up on the island of Malta. And more people hear about Jesus. Everywhere Paul goes, they hear about Jesus. And then he gets put into this prison in Rome. And he's under some sort of house arrest. He talks about his chains, so it's not the, the best arrangements, but it's a little bit freeing. He can visit with people and he can write letters and uh, take in guests. And so he's in this place, but I love God's plan. God's like, I'll bring you to Rome, taxpayer funded, <laughs> right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go on the tax dollar here, and I'm going to bring, it might not be the best, I mean, shipwreck along the way and stuff, stuff but I'm going to look after you. And so God allows Paul to have his desire. He wanted to go to Rome. There you go, Paul. You get to go to Rome. And this is, this is where we get this letter, is from this Roman prison. Now, Paul, though, was not an easy guy to persecute. His prison stays never really worked well for the prison keepers, the guards, or those who tried to make him feel really bad. They would say things like this to Paul. They're like, we're going to lock you up. And Paul would say, 
in Philippians 1.12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I'll just tell everybody in the prison about Jesus is pretty much what he's saying. And that's exactly what he did. They say to him, Paul, we're going to beat you up. Paul says in Romans 8.18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in you. And they say to Paul, Paul, we're going to kill you. Paul, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. They can't, they can't lock him up, beat him up, or kill him. They can't, they can't extinguish the, the flame. You see, Paul fought against the same flame. He tried to stomp it out. You can't put that thing out because it's an inner joy. It's an inner peace, and it's not reliant on circumstances. And so this is where we see Paul here in the Roman prison with such a clear understanding of what God had purposed what man had purposed and what God has purposed. And Paul was able to see so much more clearly than we can often see. And so I saw this done at um, some other churches when I, I watched their videos on like starting a new series. They're like, okay, this letter was never intended to be taken and dissected verse by verse. I mean, yes, that is, that is something we can do, but its first and foremost use was to be read in the church. You read the letter. If you got a church from Ephesus, you, you know, the, the church at Ephesus uh, when they received Ephesians, they didn't, for the next you know, year and a half, say, okay, we're going to every week read two verses of Paul's letter. I mean, we do that, and it's very profitable to us. But the one thing that they did right away is they read the letter. And so that's what we're going to do. Only instead of reading the letter, we are going to have Olivia quote the letter for us. And so uh, we'll have Olivia come up to the front. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may avail in still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happen to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that is from evidence to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ with a selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only then every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my salvation, through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I should be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now so Christ will be, will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I should choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I should remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Christ Jesus by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified of your adversaries, which is to them a perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, and being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. 
but each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out for your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the darkness. Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I may poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and will rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may be encouraged when I know your state. For I know no one who is like-minded will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all, and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking from your service toward me. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For, to me to, for me to write the same things to you, it is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evildoers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so. Circumcised this day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. But indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk. For many walk, as I have told you often, as you have us for a pattern, for many walk, as I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, to so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Iodia and I implore Asintichi to be of the same mind as the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a bast and to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Ep Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now it's for God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So what did you guys do with your summer? <laughs> we know what Olivia did. That uh, is fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Olivia. That means so much to us. And it means so much to me because I know how this is going to be uh, an impact and a direction-changing direction, direction changing feature for the rest of her life. That those words are going to mean something more and more to her as she grows in her faith as she continues in her walk, as she goes through different circumstances in life, um, those words are going to, uh, to be a huge impact on her. I think she ran downstairs to be a part of the dance, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you've got to be a part of that. Um, so uh, anyway, so blessed by, uh, by what uh, she had done and, uh, in memorizing that. And I want to encourage you guys, too, that when you memorize Scripture, you, know, you get the meaning, and then over time, more and more meaning comes to you. It's such a gem. And that's what I'm saying, like, you know, for 28 years, that scripture has been just, you know, coming back to me and feeding me for 28 years. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, we had this, this coffee maker in our kitchen that uh, my dad bought it for us. Um, I'm a bit of a coffee snob. And so he bought me this coffee machine, like, almost 10 years ago. It's this high-end machine. And I looked at the statistics. It's got statistics on it. So I looked at the statistics the other day, and it said that we are at 40,000 cups of coffee. Um, over 10 years. That's not too much for 10 years, right? But uh, I don't know. Maybe it, it just means we have a lot of people over for coffee. You guys have drank some of that coffee. Don't judge me. Or it means Angie drinks a lot of coffee. I don't know. But the interesting thing is I flipped one past the, the setting button, and, and the one complaint we had, we love our coffee machine. Like, we love it, Dad. We thank you all the time for that. But the one complaint we had was, if only it could be just a bit hotter, Anyways, I'm flipping through. I flip five statistics, and there's a feature that says, raise the heat, the temperature. 40,000 cups later, we realize we can just turn it a bit hot. I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, I never knew that was there. I was like, so now our coffee is now amazing, and it's extra hot, which is the way that uh, I prefer it anyways. And so uh, it's like, this thing was, has been an amazing gift, and suddenly there's another thing that I never learned. And that's how I feel with Philippians. Things will pop out at me. A verse I memorized, you know, 30 years ago, and suddenly something will come out, and it just hits me like I never saw that before. And God uses it to help me through a trial or through a difficulty and gives me a whole other perspective. I tell you, his word is living, and uh, it will have dividends for the rest of your life when you hide it in your heart and your mind. But I thought in closing today, I... Um, I thought it was interesting. I always, I always thought about doing something like this myself, but uh, I never really wanted to take the time and effort to do it. I thought it'd be fun to put together a trip advisor from the Apostle Paul uh, based on all of his prison experiences. I mean, he would have the full page, right? All the prisons of the Roman Empire and the, that vicinity. 
um, that would be all written by Apostle Paul. And so I thought to myself, I, I don't have time again. Once again, I don't have time to do this, but ChatGPT has all the time in the world. And so I thought I'd throw that in there just for fun. I mean, it did create that sermon graphic at the front here. So um, let's, see, let's see what it pulled out. This is TripAdvisor from, uh, from Apostle Paul. And uh, the first one he gives a review on is Philippi. He's, he calls it the earth-shaking experience. He gave it four stars. A surprise hit on my missionary tour. Wasn't expecting uh, a, a concert venue, but the acoustics in this place were heavenly. And so he says it made for a great uh, hymn jam. The unexpected earthquake room, um, a, a earthquake escape room, added a thrilling twist to the stay. Met the jailer and his family, wonderful folks. They even enjoyed the faith. Would visit again, but maybe without the flogging. And then uh, this one's from his uh, stay at the Jerusalem holdup. He calls it a riotous time. Two stars. He says, I arrived amid a, amidst a riot, and he did. Talk about a warm welcome. He, the holding cell was nothing to write home about, although it did provide a front row seat to the local drama. Not the best spot for a peaceful retreat, but certainly the best place to watch and witness passion in action, an experience for the sturdy, harder, hearted believer. This one is um, his third, there's four altogether. This is the, Ces the Ces Caesarean, I can't even say that name, uh, custody. He calls it sea views with a side of legal drama. And that's exactly what it was. Three stars he gives it. The coastal view was a divine touch, a serene backdrop to the courtroom theatrics. Being a guest of honor for Felix and Festus was, well, an experience. Could do better with the food, but spiritual nourishment was top-notch. And finally, the one from which he is actually writing this letter to the Philippians. Roman house arrest. He calls it the center of action. He gives us three stars. Nestled in the heart of the empire, the locale is unbeatable for those seeking to rub shoulders with movers and shakers of the age. Under house arrest, the chains were a bit restrictive, but the local Christian fellowship was uplifting. Manage to pen some letters and enjoy spirited debates, a mix of imperial ambiance with a touch of heavenly hope. And that was from the Roman prisoner prison. And isn't it lovely that that's how he ended the letter? He's like, all the saints who are uh, with me greet you, especially those who are of Caesar's household. You know, what an opportunity. Paul took every opportunity, and he preached the gospel to those who were of Caesar's household. That's awesome. And so we're going to get into this amazing letter over the next few weeks. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us to, together today. Mm -hmm.